What's up everybody? I'm Ryan the Cyber Hobbit, and in this video, I'm going to be making a one-third scale 3D printed Iron Man. I really hope you like it. I had a ton of fun. Always remember, your focus determines your reality. So some of you may have seen some of my other 3D printed projects before, specifically the Philby's diorama I made last year. And although I was very happy with the finished result, it's undeniable that up close you can easily tell that it was a 3D printed creation because of all the visible layer lines. Now I could have bought a resin 3D printer to get those high details, but I wanted to try to make something with a 3D printer I already own, which is FDM based. With this in mind, I wanted to challenge myself to create something that wasn't so obviously 3D printed. I wanted none of the visible layer lines that my Felbeast diorama suffered from. Basically something I knew that I could easily sand without destroying the details. That's when I came across this amazingly detailed one-third scale model of the Mark VII Iron Man on CG Trader by DID3D. This felt like the perfect next step in my journey of creating things, as not only would it be the largest thing I had ever 3D printed, it also had some things I had always wanted to learn how to do, but just never really had a good reason to do yet. Specifically dealing with wires, LEDs, soldering, and Arduinos. Now the model does come with very detailed instructions, so I won't be going over every set that you can find there, but I will be going over my process, though it won't be a step-by-step -step guide, because I only really started filming this about halfway through making it, so. Also, I want to say this up front, this project took me about three to four months to create, though mostly working weekends, and everything that you see in this video was my process. I realize that there are probably better, quicker, and easier ways to do some of the things you'll see in this video, but as this was my learning experience, I just wanted to share with you my process. So I'm going to start at the point at which most of the parts have actually already been printed, even some sanded, primed, and painted. But I will go through the entire process for one of the shoulder pieces so that you can understand exactly what it took for me to build this. Obviously, the very first step is the 3D printing. You'd think that this step might have even taken the longest, but actually I had most of the things printed within the first month. This was actually the easy part, as all you really have to do is just press go once you get your settings set up. Now if you're curious the settings I use for printing, here's a quick graphic to show some of the finer details. These may not be the settings that you should use, but it's what I settled on knowing how my printer operates. There were some pieces that I just knew that my printer wouldn't be able to handle, as well as some parts that needed to be printed crystal clear to allow light to pass through. So for these parts, I actually used an online service that could print them in resin, called Craft Cloud 3D. There are many online services that do this, but that's just the one that I went with. I even had some of the pieces printed twice, in case I messed up and needed a backup. It might have been a little bit expensive, but I think it was well worth it because I've heard some horror stories from people trying to print something in a transparent resin. The next step was the oh so fun sanding and priming. The sanding was undoubtedly the longest and most difficult part of this entire build, but it's the only way to get the results that I wanted with the tools that I had. I did a ton of sanding, and I mean a ton of sanding. Literally about two months worth. Obviously the bigger parts took longer, but on average I'd say I spent at least two to three hours sanding each part. The first pass of sanding was done in a 220 grit sandpaper. Essentially, I sanded until I could no longer see any of the shiny reflective parts of the layer lines. Next I applied a Rust-Oleum 2-in-1 sandable primer and then let it dry overnight. After it was completely dry, I then started with another pass of sanding, but this time with a 600 grit sandpaper. I know that I might not have needed to sand as much as I did on the second pass, but basically I sanded until I could feel with my fingers a very smooth surface. Essentially, until I could see the original print color, but with all the divots and imperfections still filled in with the primer. The next step was painting. Now I don't own an airbrush, and hand painting just wasn't going to be viable to get the results I wanted. So instead I opted to use automotive spray paint, as I'm pretty sure that's what Tony Stark used, right? What? Throw a little hot rod red in there. Yes, that should help you keep a low profile. There are three different colored parts in this build. Well, technically four if you include the base. Silver, gold, red, and a dark metallic gunmetal for the base. To start each color though, I would first coat them with a black primer. 
After waiting 24 hours to make sure they were completely dry, I would use this time to follow up and remove any paint drips or imperfections I could see with a shorter sanding session of a 1000 grit sandpaper. After which, if needed, I would apply another coat of the black primer. For the silver parts, I would apply two coats of the silver spray paint. And for both the gold and red parts, I would apply two coats of the gold spray paint. After the gold is completely dry, now's your last chance to fix any small imperfections that you see with the 1000 grit sandpaper again. After you're satisfied, now comes the red. So this red paint is not a typical spray paint. It's a transparent paint, meaning it's meant to be put on top of a metallic paint. That's why we did the gold first. Though beware, this red loves to run and create drip lines. I learned a very hard lesson and ended up tossing a few parts because of the horrible drips. It's basically impossible to sand and fix any drips at this point without having to re-sand the entire part. Here's an example of some of the drips I tried to fix, but it just didn't work out. Keep track of how many red coats you do. I ended up doing three, but here's an example of what happens when I did four. Just way too dark. It's very important to read the small text on the back of each spray paint to understand exactly how to apply it. Also, before I forget, make sure to cover up the white areas on the inside of the base before painting. I used this really nice frog tape to do that as you need the inside to be white to help reflect the light from the LEDs up. After all the silver, gold, and red were done drying, red usually being 24 to 48 hours, I would then apply the clear coat. The first pass of applying the clear coat I would do very, very lightly, almost like a fine dust. Then I would follow up with two to three more layers, waiting about 10 to 15 minutes between each coat. Sometimes the clear coat can look a little foggy, but after waiting about 24 hours, usually it all goes away. After all the parts are painted, clear coated, and dry, it's time to start gluing some of the smaller parts together. I used a combination of hot glue and Gorilla Super Glue gel depending on the part. Because of all the paint layers, some of the parts didn't really fit together perfectly, so I had to sand them down to make sure they could fit better. I found gluing the parts together to be actually very rewarding, because it's at this stage I could finally see some of my hard work paying off. The next step was to start putting together all the wires and LEDs. Now I was a complete newbie when it came to doing this as I had never soldered a single thing before this project, but I promise you it was actually much easier than I thought it would be. The idea here is to cut LEDs off of a light strip and wire them up together. In order to do that, I had to scratch off the white paint next to each LED to reveal the copper that runs along each LED. This will allow you to attach solder next to each LED. Something to note though, just stripping off the paint wasn't enough. I actually had to go a bit deeper as there seems to be a tiny layer of something transparent between the white and the copper. I basically just kept going until I could see the reflective copper. I can't tell you how frustrated I was before I realized I needed to do this. Also, it's important to keep track of which side is positive and which side is negative. I found an easy way to do that was just to apply the solder to the positive side first. Also, you don't see it in this clip, but I found that scratching the negative side before cutting the LEDs was really helpful. After I cut each LED, I placed them all next to each other using the bit of glue that comes on the strip onto the bits of plastic you're supposed to remove when applying the LEDs. This helped to hold them in place while I was soldering everything together. Using helping hands is very crucial to this part. I don't see how you could do it without them. I really had to take my time with this. I will admit I got kind of frustrated with some parts and had to toss them, but eventually I got there.
After I had them all initially connected, I applied a bit more solder on top just to make sure the connection was very strong. Once I had a wire on both sides, it was time to test the LEDs. To test, I simply touched each wire to the end of the original LED strip to make sure the LEDs all turned on. I might have done a few happy dances after I saw this initially working. And then I did a few laps around my apartment once I had the LEDs installed in the visor. Holy crap, it works. It's working! It's working! After I had all the small parts painted and glued together and everything was soldered, it was finally time to start putting everything together. I laid the bigger parts out on a towel to make sure I didn't scratch them. An easy way to get all the wires to run through the holes correctly is to use some copper craft wire and solder them to it. Then you can push the craft wire through and then pull them along with it. I ended up using an entire stick of hot glue to secure the body to the waist. And once that was done, it was so great to finally see the Iron Man standing all on his own. The only thing left to do was to connect all the wires to the Arduino, but now the hard part's over. Instead of just soldering the wires directly to the Arduino, I instead soldered them to some jumper cables. That way I could easily disconnect the Iron Man from the base in case I ever needed to transport him. Once everything was soldered and plugged in, I was finally done. Okay guys, that about wraps up this video. I really had a blast working on this project, I really did. By the way, I put some links in the description to a bunch of the things that I used that you've seen in this video, not just the 3D printed uh, material. So if you guys really enjoyed this video, I would really appreciate it if you could subscribe, or maybe even just give it a thumbs up. But until next time, bye bye.